Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Maurice here. Gives me great pleasure to uh, share with you a use case um, that uh, my uh, colleagues and I have been collaborating with uh, the Intel uh, Big Deal uh, product team. Um, I'll start with the use case per se. Jenny will cover uh, the next uh, two elements, uh, and then we'll share next steps and uh, sort of the takeaways of where we are uh, in this uh, um, uh, use case. So um, I'm a statistician. Uh, I guess today you'd say data scientist at uh, the World Bank. And uh, very quickly, um, this means that I work for an institution that is not a commercial bank, actually. Uh, our clients, our countries, uh, we work uh, pretty much around the world. We provide support to a variety uh, of uh, country governments uh, in support of their own uh, population to solve either global problems or regional and national uh, problems. And this cuts across a variety of ranges from microeconomic policy to uh, infrastructure development uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, specifically, I work in the development data group where we uh, provide support to national statistical agencies as well as global uh, agencies that focus on official statistics around the world and uh, as a result we're the premier source of uh, global indicators in a variety of domains so if you want to know about the latest uh, and greatest on uh, GDP in country X, Y or Z or compare uh, across uh, economies or look at education indicators we're often the primary source of that information we're not the sole source but uh, a lot of that data uh, comes through us and disseminates and emanates from us to the use case at hand, um, I uh, was here at Spark Summit last year uh, as a uh, happy and proud attendee and stumbled upon one of the booths. It happened to be uh, the Intel uh, team. They had an interesting uh, demo about a very uh, touching use case involving the National Center for Missing Children, uh, where they demoed something that struck a, uh, you know, struck a note and also led me to ask them, how are you guys doing this? And, I'd be interested in talking about collaboration. So the actual problem that uh, my team and I uh, face uh, is the following. We run uh, on a purely experimental basis, uh, something similar to what we normally do over a very long period of time, which is run a, uh, what we call, call a price survey, comparing um, uh, the size, the relative size of economies across uh, countries. And so for this experiment, we wanted to see what would it be like instead of working with national statistical agencies to uh, crowdsource the collection of price information uh, in order to see how, you know, what would, be, would we be able to learn from this. At the time, I made the mistake in a way of suggesting that we collect as part of the ground truth images. You know, what we want and care about are prices, uh, but since we were getting people to go around with feature phones, Android, on, uh, you know, using an app, collecting a bunch of images, uh, we got a bunch of images. Next problem is something we hadn't envisioned is what do you do with millions of images? Uh, when you're in the business of you know, running all sorts of interesting models and learning about uh, data, images for us are not really data. So we ended up with nearly 3 million images as written here, uh, cutting across 162 uh, what we consider tightly uh, defined categories, basically meaning well-specified labels. So those images are meant to represent something that's very well described so that if you go around pricing, you will be able to report the price of, let's say, half to one kilogram or you know, half to one pound of X per these exact specification, right, to minimize the mistakes. And as a result, um, we then found ourselves wondering, realizing that some of those images that were reported uh, to us in this uh, experiment might contain personally identifiable information, uh, even though we were and are interested in releasing this data set, so for us the data are the prices, uh, but ultimately uh, the images could be also released and all the great stuff I've been hearing about and learning about in terms of what's uh, you know, coming with uh, deep learning, uh, you know, all these great things that uh, now are, people are able to do, this could become a public data set, essentially, of uh, you know, up to three million images. Uh, 
but we can't release them without knowing that we're not providing images that contain personally identifiable information. And so the challenge associated with these images, uh, some of them are listed here, different quality, as I mentioned, feature phones, so one megapixel to eight megapixel, I mean, kind of making this up, but imagine people feature phone here, the latest, greatest Android phone there, reporting images based on what we asked them to report. And those images, as a result, may not be very focused. You have more than one item in the image, and you'll see in a sec what I mean. Uh, some of the images turned out to be not useful or usable, in a sense, corrupted. Um, and that can complicate your, you know, your ETL process. And uh, again, we run this across uh, 15 countries. So it's not the US, it's 15 different languages, uh, different scripts, and you'll understand in a sec, if you think about personally identifiable information, it's not your typical license plate detection uh, thing where you can say, or, or you know, give me the social security number or tell me which image contains a social security number or you know, very standardized uh, text form. And as a, uh, and, you know, as a kicker, the images uh, contain, those relevant images contain both at times typed and handwritten uh, information. So OCR, mm, not so easy. So here's an example of the type of images we got. So it's not your typical nice uh, cat versus dog uh, image problem where you know, the images are well centered with the you know, happy puppy uh, looking straight uh, at you. First one, you see onions, but some things on the side. The other is a basket of carrots, it seems. Third one is supposed to be an image of cucumbers. But if you look carefully, you see a bunch of other things. Uh, and then the, uh, the last one is uh, apples in a given country. So uh, before I turn, to, turn it over to Jenny uh, and tell you how we went about solving uh, what we've accomplished uh, to this point, uh, we broke this project uh, you know, in uh, two phases, and we'll focus on the first phase uh, in this uh, presentation. So we decided to basically take the three million image uh, data set, again, data set in this context, the images are what we're now looking at, and focus on a subset of those uh, well-defined labels. Uh, and in order to take this forward, then uh, we looked at food-related items uh, that are not, by definition, likely to contain personally identifiable information. The logic being that if we're able to start with that, classify those images, or validate through some uh, form of classification, we'll be able to release a first batch of images and then tackle the second, uh, the second phase, which you see here, uh, which is a little more complicated uh, as well uh, around the um, detection of personally identifiable information. But let me just be clear, the three million images, we simply could not work on otherwise. So by doing this, we're actually now able to begin to work on a way to release this uh, data set, which otherwise we would never have been able to, um, you know, to tackle. So I'll pass it on to Jenny, and then I'll be back with the takeaways. Okay. Please, Jenny. Hello, everybody. I'm Jenny Wang from Intel Big Data uh, Technology team. And uh, I'm a very uh, uh, favorite to do this project with the Maurice in the World Bank. And uh, now I will give an introduction of the, our solution architecture. Uh, the whole architecture is based on the AWS cloud, and uh, on this uh, AWS cloud, we use the Databricks Spark system, and we use the Databricks file system as storage, and our true data it, data set is stored in the AWS S3 storage. And uh, for the deep learning part, we use the Big Deal as uh, uh, infrastructure, and uh, to create the real applications, uh, we use the Analytic Zoo, which is the open source project that's based on the big deal on Apache Spark. And the first, let's look at what's a big deal. Big deal is a distributed deep learning library for Apache Spark. Compared with other deep, uh, Spark libraries, deep learning libraries, uh, big deal libraries is a native Spark library. 
it can easy to in, uh, integrate with other uh, Spark components like the MLLib, Spark Streaming, to create the end-to-end -end pipeline applications. So Big Deal is uh, designed for the big data, especially for the Parch and the Hadoop systems. And uh, I heard a many uh, 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 talks from our customers. They have already have the clusters, Spark clusters and Hadoop clusters, and they want to deploy the deep learning on their existing environment. So big, uh, big deal is a very easy way to make it uh, in, uh, to make the deep learning more accessible to the uh, data scientists and uh, uh, big data users. So the users can write the big deal program just as a standard Spark program. And uh, for the uh, big data users, the data, they don't need to move data from the uh, existing cluster to another cluster. So, and also be, because Big Deal is also a deep learning library, so it provides the same functionality as other platform like the Cafe TensorFlow or Torch. And uh, based on the Intel MQL libraries and uh, uh, multi-threaded multi programming, the big uh, big data, uh, the big deal program can run, can get the high performance as the GPU clusters. So, by leveraging the Spark, the big deal program can be easy and efficient to scale out on multiple nodes. And uh, it's very easy to for the user to submit the big deal program. Uh, the user can submit uh, the big deal job in the driver, and the driver would uh, trigger a lot uh, Spark tasks on the workers, and which will call the interim care to do uh, deep learning computations, and the, the driver, uh, workers will synchronize the parameter between the clusters. And uh, to train a, a big model, the user always want to save the model, so Big Deal provides the functionality to save the snapshot of the model. And also, the very cool thing is that Big Deal can be in compatible, compatible with other deep learning libraries. So it can load the Cafe Torch TensorFlow and the Keras model into the Big Deal environment and, and uh, make the, uh, use the pre-trained uh, models uh, to do the fine tuning or inference in the Spark environment. And the uh, big deal is initiated with the uh, uh, Scala API, but it also provides the Python API. So now we already support the Python 2.7, 3.5, and 3.6. And it's very easy to use big deal Python API with other Python libraries to create a, a complex uh, analytic system. And uh, also, Big Deal can run in the interactive notebooks like the Jupyter and Zeppelin and the Databricks notebooks. And uh, in this use case, we use the Databricks notebook to write the program. And uh, if the user want to monitor or visualize the deep learning, the uh, big, big deal can be integrated with the TensorBoard. So you can uh, check the uh, learning, uh, the training and the inference data and uh, monitor the parameters in the TensorBoard. But uh, um, to make the big deal uh, easier for the user to create their applications, Recently, uh, we open sourced the uh, Analytics Zoo project, which is the analytics AI pipelines for Spark and uh, based on the big deal. Um, it includes uh, many use cases like the fraud detection, time series prediction, sentiment analytics, chatbot, etc. 
And uh, it also includes some uh, pre-trained models, like the object detection, image classification, text classification, recommendation models. So user can leverage these uh, predefined models to, to, do their, uh, to create their customer models. And uh, uh, to help user to pre their data, we create a libraries to do the feature transformations. It can do the transformation for the 2D images, 3D image, text, and speech preprocessing. And uh, to make it a data scientist and the user to write the program, we provide the high-level APIs, which can support the Spark data frame format. And also, we, we create the uh, Spark, we create the estimator and the classifier which is uh, compatible with the Spark ML pipeline to, make, uh, to help the user to create the, the whole pipeline system on Spark. And uh, we also provide the Keras uh, Zoo API, which can make the user to write their code using the Keras uh, syntax. Okay, so let's look at the model development in this use case and the results. Uh, as Maris said, uh, we have two phases. The first one is to do the image classifications. So for the, for, for the image classifications, we consider several ways to do that. Uh, we can train from the scratch or we can use the transfer learning or fine tune with the pre-trained uh, model. And uh, for the transfer learning and the fine tune, we, we tried to use the pre-trained inception V1 model. And we load this model into the big deal and add the fully connection layers with the softmax classifier to do our classifications. And the, as a practice, we trained on the partial data set first. And the, after we trained the, with the partial data set, we uh, trained the whole data set, which is about one million images and uh, about one terabyte. And uh, on the multi nodes cluster environment in AWS Databricks. So here is the uh, the model we used. So you can see in the left, it's uh, uh, Inception V1 model, but we removed the last two layers, which is the uh, fully connection layers, and, uh, and then we add the customer classifier to do our own classifications. So here is the uh, code snips for the transfer learning. Uh, the left is uh, transfer learning training, so you can see here, first we load the big deal pre-trained inception v model, and then we create our neural network. Using the pre-trained model, we add the new uh, fully connection layers, and then we create a NN classifier, which is a estimator, is a Spark estimator, and then we Call the fit to train this uh, 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 model, and the, in the right side is uh, prediction and evalu evaluations. So the prediction is uh, compatible with the Spark pipeline uh, routines. So it called the transform function to do the prediction, and it, it used the Spark uh, MLLib. Uh, evaluation method to do the evaluation. So this slide is about the code of the fine tuning training and the predict and evaluations. The difference is that after we load the model, uh, we didn't freeze uh, uh, previous layers and we added the, our new uh, classifier and we trained the whole model And the prediction and evaluation is similar as the transfer, uh, transfer learning. 
So let's look at the result for these three ways. Uh, we tried on the partial data set, which include uh, about uh, 2,000 images with nine categories. And the training from scratch takes the long, longest time and uh, get the lowest accuracy. But for transfer learning, which takes the shortest time and get better accuracy than the training from scratch. And for fine tuning, when we only train uh, 15 epochs and we get the highest accuracy. So by this uh, test, uh, we try to use the fine tune to do the training for the whole data set. As you know, the whole data set is uh, so big. It, uh, the data is about one terabyte, so it cannot be trained on one node. So we use 20 nodes to train this model and we use the fine tuning. And uh, uh, eventually, we get the accuracy as 81.7%. Uh, and uh, we also did the scaling test of the big deal on the AWS Databricks cluster. So we use the AWS R4 instance to create the cluster, and we create the eight node cluster and the six node cluster and the training with the same batch size with the same epochs and the, you can see uh, from the di uh, diagram that with the increase of the nodes the throughput increase uh, nearly linear uh, linearly so it shows that big deal has a good scalability in the cluster environment For the phase two, we already in the investigations and the testing period. Uh, for the phase two, which is to find the personal information and to blur the personal information in the images, there are many. There are several steps. The first step is image quali quality preprocessing. So we want we want to do the filter with uh, uh, print text only and using OpenCV or other Python libraries to, to pre-process in the image. And the, to detect the text and uh, make the bounding box on the text, we consider several models. After we get the, the bounding box of the text, we need to recognize the text. So we also consider these two models. And uh, after we get recognized the text, we need to determine whether the text is uh, PI or not PI. So we are thinking to use the RNN model to recognize the personal information with the leading words. And uh, after we get the PI uh, information, we will use the image tools to blur these areas. Okay, so let's, uh, Maurice, to give the summary of this use case. Sure, thank you. Um, so I know it's late afternoon. Um, I'll try and be quick, but I wanna tell you guys, this is really exciting for me. Um, as I said, we had this data set that basically was sitting around stale. We couldn't do anything with it, and um, you know, numbers are numbers, but what you're seeing is that we were able to train at scale on Spark in a way that is very simple for someone like me now to write some Python code that lets me interact with a deep learning uh, framework on Spark with minimal uh, tweaking on a in a cluster environment. And so, you know, this is real for us. This really makes a big difference. Um, and, uh, you know, Big DL is one of the uh, many uh, frameworks that are out there. Uh, there was a presentation I attended earlier about the deep learning pipelines. It wasn't mentioned there, but I think it's worth being mentioned as one of the frameworks that lets you do deep learning, uh, you know, distributed deep learning in a very streamlined and easy way. 
and uh, the new um, uh, analytics zoo that they're uh, releasing also as an open source project makes, uh, again, life for data scientists like me uh, easy. Um, and leveraging you know, the type of infrastructure that most of you uh, work on, you know, whether it's A, B, C, D, uh, you know, it's as easy as pip install, a uh, couple of uh, lines, and uh, you're able to do what uh, you'll start uh, working on initially locally. Now here are links to uh, both you know, the Intel uh, deep learning library, but for this uh, particular uh, use case, I wanted to mention, as I said earlier, that uh, for us, this is a work in progress, uh, but this is already a big milestone because you know, we're starting to see a way out where we'll be able to release uh, these images as a public data set down the line. Uh, Intel has kindly provided an AMI that you can access and uh, you know, start playing uh, with, if you so wish. And uh, the specific code linked to what we've done so far is available through this GitHub uh, link. Um, and we'd love to hear, I'd love to hear from uh, folks who have better and more experience than I on uh, solving this. I've benefited, and my colleagues and I have benefited from you know, all the support from uh, Intel, uh, as well as uh, Databricks, I should say, uh, and AWS in uh, getting uh, getting us to where we are today. Uh, so with that, I would like to leave time, hopefully, for a couple of questions or comments. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, what's the difference between Big Deal versus, uh, in today's keynote, that project, Hydrogen? So it looks like Big Deal has a lot of features which actually uh, sort of matches uh, TensorFlow, Caffeine, and if we can do everything with big deal, what's the point to do hydrogen? I think I just mentioned the big deal is designed for the big data, so it's a, a Spark library, so it it's a designed for running the deep learning applications on the Spark or Hadoop environments. I think other libraries, they are not very easy to make it run on the Spark environment. Yeah, that's correct that there are open source projects try to do TensorFlow on Spark or uh, some yeah. other frameworks on Spark. Now we have Big Deal on Spark, which actually looks like provide all the things that we need. And why Databricks, uh, Databricks is doing hydrogen, sort of try to uh, bring all the AI frameworks to Spark. Actually, let me answer this. I'm from the big deal. Okay, so that was a fair question. Um, actually, big deal is the only library that is organic to Spark. Um, so it's almost a natural extension of Spark. But the reality is that you know, data scientists have a lot of choices, and many of them may have already started working with TensorFlow or Cafe or uh, MXNet and trying to make it work with Spark. And my understanding, based on what was announced at Hydrogen, the Hydrogen project, is they are now trying to see if those frameworks that were not necessarily designed for Spark can actually make use of Spark, not just as a launcher, but uh, there's a little more organic interaction with Spark. And also, another thing I saw with Project Hydrogen was. <coughs> They are trying to make it, um, I guess, accelerator aware. So most Spark workloads uh, run on CPUs, but there are so many other hardware choices. So Project Hydrogen makes, tries to make sure that, you know, under the hood, can those different hardware environments be taken care of? At least that's the sense I got. But I think that would be a Databricks question in terms of, well, Big DL can provide feature parity, and it's almost a natural extension. It works with data frames. It works with Spark ML. So do we really need to go and try and make all these other frameworks have a coarse grain interaction with Spark? Yeah, that's a really good point. You probably want to swing by the booth, and you can probably ask that question to some of the, uh, the engineers who are there. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more. All right, thank you. And I have a question about the, uh, the phase one, about the transfer learning and uh, fine tune. So we can see that there, there was a very great improvement when you, about the accuracy when you uh, apply uh, 
fine tuning. Yeah. So I wonder that uh, is did, did you use the the result, the train weight from the transfer learning, or you just do, or you just uh, retrain the 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 whole model uh, from scratch during the fine tuning? So. Uh, the, there, there are some difference between the transfer learning and the fine tune. So transfer learning, it would uh, freeze the layers in the uh, pre-trained pre models, and it will only train the the customer classifier layers. And the fine tuning is different. It did not uh, freeze the layers. It will train the whole model. But the the difference between training from scratch and fine tuning is that. Uh, the initial weights for the fine tuning, the initial weights is from the pre model. But for training from scratch, the initial weights and bios are from the maybe some random values. So that's different. So that's why the fine tune can take less apples to get a better result. All right, so I think we're out of time. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Maurice and Jenny, for this session. Appreciate it. <laughs>